Everything about animation in Japan today is the result of decades and decades of stylistic evolution. Changes in technology, important cultural events, economic shifts, innovative practitioners, they all contribute to this flowing timeline of anime. Styles can change drastically in just a few years, triggered by something as small as a single series or movie. There are really fascinating, clear patterns that emerge when you look at a medium in chronological order. Watching how these trends repeat and develop is something I'm really fascinated by. Your favourite character design or animation cut will without a doubt have its roots in shows from 30, 40 years ago. It's both very important and extremely interesting to see how everything links together in one giant web of influence. Firstly, we need to track that web all the way back to its roots with the birth of animation in Japan. The first wave of Japanese animation came at the start of the 20th century. During the early decades, a number of anime films were produced. It's a difficult period to cover because there wasn't a whole lot of animation coming out of Japan, and the stuff that was being made was propaganda material commissioned by the government. Momotaro's Sea Eagles is a good example of this era, well, stylistically. It obviously black and white, very slow, simple movements with static painted backgrounds. Lots of the animations in each scene are loops of the same kind of four or five frames just played over and over again. Movies like this were jam-packed with political propaganda, pushing different idealisms from the Japanese government. Everything was directly correlated with the World War. Haku Jaden in 1950 is another good example. Uh, the film is almost completely flat in its dimensions, almost like a puppet show. But there is actually a lot of really impressive animation. Unfortunately, everything here is just too far and few between. There's definitely not enough to have any kind of real stylistic development. And it took a long time before there was enough creative control and resources for the medium to start developing. I mean, the 30s, 40s and 50s move at a snail pace compared to the later decades. The medium really struggled to find a stylistic identity. But that definitely changed as we go into the 60s. The 1960s was very much a stylistic kickstart for anime. It saw the birth of the anime TV series, multiple long-running series that started to appear every year. Uh, with that came opportunities for directors and animators to really express their own styles. This started the stylistic evolution of anime. Certain titles started to influence each other and distinct trends started to emerge as more and more shows were made. The early 60s is a period that would essentially shape the whole medium. What happened here is very important. A good point to observe this is Tezuka's Astro Boy in 1963, essentially the catalyst for this boom in anime. The characteristics of this show become a stylistic base point for almost everything that follows, one of the most important being the show's smart, simple design. This allowed both rich emotional expression as well as maintaining a realistic style of animation. Obviously, Japanese production studios weren't operating at the same level as other animation studios like Disney at the time, so movement had to be used very resourcefully. Astro Boy's character design was very intelligent. Movable joints like elbows and knees had almost no detail, leaving any complexity for static aspects like his belt or his hair. This allowed Astro Boy to look interesting, but also made him very easy to animate. Emotions were expressed through his hands and his face, which leads to another important element used in the series, the eyes. Astro Boy's eyes are very recognisable, because it's a style that's still very popular today. They're very big and bold, allowing animators to express a lot of information using very simple visuals. Background art was even more limited. They were expressive, but they lacked detail and never really moved. Sometimes block colours or gradients filled up the whole screen. We see these characteristics continued and developed upon in the 60s with shows like Tetsujin and Prince Planet. And as the decade progressed, a number of stylistic changes started to take place, mainly influenced by the revolutionary introduction of colour. Kimba the White Lion in 1965 is a great place to look. Here you can see the stark improvements from Astro Boy and Tetsujin. The core style is still very simple, but the backgrounds, for example, are far more detailed and sometimes even dynamic. Colour allowed them to be so much more expressive with their backgrounds, using large-scale painted landscapes for their settings. Character design detail also improved, not only in details of elements like clothing, but allowing that detail to move with more fluidity. Action saw a massive quality increase. From the quick, scarcely animated scenes in Astro Boy and Tetsujin, Kimba had a bigger focus on movement and scale. This allowed them to add a lot more emotion and weight into their scenes. These slight improvements continued throughout the 60s, highlighted even more so in 1967's Speed Racer. By this time, we're seeing animation that we're more used to seeing today. 1969's Dororo is very noteworthy. Where the other series of the 60s were very much for a younger audience, Dororo targeted a more mature audience with more dark, violent imagery. There was a lot of death and fighting that was absent from a lot of its predecessors. Dororo also took a heavy influence from cinema, classic samurai films from the 50s and 60s being a clear influence. 
This is probably one of the most important aspects, using cinematic techniques to push the medium in its own stylistic direction. Lighting, composition and more complex animation all played a part in the moulding of anime of the late 60s, and this regularity in TV anime caused an increase in development. More progress was being made in the 60s than was made during the first 30-40 years of the medium. Production teams began to grow larger and creative risks were taken. Experimental productions are usually the catalyst for innovation. In 1971, Osamu Dezaki proved this with Ashita no Jo, possibly one of the most progressive works in the medium so far. It took the TV anime format that had been established and injected it with a cinematic flair. This could be a response to how prosperous and experimental the movie industry had become in the 60s. One of the most obvious changes is the huge leap in character detail and animation. Compared to even five years ago, Dezaki's characters are far more detailed and utilise movement more efficiently. This is mirrored in Lupin the Third the same year. At the time, these were some of the most detailed characters in the medium, with some of the most expressive animation. You'll notice also that these shows were aimed at a much older audience. Where the likes of Astro Boy and Kimba were aimed at young teenagers, Joe and Lupin had a much older demographic, and this definitely affected them stylistically. What starts to develop in a really interesting way in the 70s is the animation of human elements. We start to see a lot in Joe and Lupin with their more realistic character designs and detailed facial expressions, but it's in the more subtle shows that this really starts. If you look at Heyday Girl of the Alps in 1974, there's a huge focus on the animation of things like facial expressions and body movement. Unlike almost everything that I've mentioned so far, Heyday didn't have action to portray strong emotions, so animation had to be focused in the small details. And there are a number of shows that echo this development, Nobody's Boy Remy and later Akagi no An. The amount of detail put into a single facial expression in this show was spectacular, unlike really anything the medium had seen before. Animation was no longer a scarcely used tool for key scenes, it was now being utilised in the intricacies of a show. Background art is also something that grows very heavily in these shows. These backgrounds were created with such detail and skill, with multiple layers moving differently from each other, but also a level of consistency. They blend with the animation of a show and start to form incredibly immersive worlds. Another important development that strived in different areas was the boom of mech anime in the 70s. This is really important development because it dominates the industry for about 20 years. Some of the early titles such as Kashan or Grandizer in 1974 show the beginnings of this trend. Obviously they all develop a lot from the sci-fi shows of the 60s, but it's here where they start to really create a specific identity. Mechanical animation was something really unique to anime. Shows like Yamato and Techman are prime examples of how Japanese animators were making this their speciality. It would become something that Japan would be known for worldwide. Loads of complex, detailed mechanical animations started to appear. So much so that the production of Space Battleship Yamato included a dedicated team for mechanical design, Studio Nui, leading us to one of the single most most important titles for the medium, Mobile Suit Gundam in 1979, a show that would become the stylistic benchmark for the next decade of anime. The legendary Kunio Okawara was behind the mechanical design for this series, possibly making the most important set of designs the medium had seen so far. It wasn't just the complexity of the mech designs that are important here, it's the level to which they're animated. It's simply outstanding, and crazy to think that just 15 years before, Astro Boy was just beginning to incorporate what is now relatively basic animation. And this development in mechanical animation continues into the 80s, where it becomes one of the most important areas of the medium. And there's a huge wave of mech anime during the 80s. Instantly, you can see how fast the medium is developing stylistically. I want to start with Macross in 1982. What's most important to see here is the development of specific areas. Dynamic animated backgrounds, for instance. This is something that really starts to develop in the 80s. Before, TV anime would just have simple images, or maybe layered images as backgrounds. In Macross, the line between the foreground and the background started to blur, and this becomes one of the most important technical developments. Also, what changes is how characters and objects are drawn. Macross has that sketchy style animation that you see in Mobile Suit Gundam, this time far more detailed and dynamic, and this is a big change from the bolder, more solid line work of previous TV anime, and it opens up opportunities for more unique movement. This causes important details like hair movement and clothing detail, aspects that were sorely missed in previous years. Macross really set the standard for TV mech anime, and you can see how that reflects into other shows like Armored Trooper Votoms, one of my personal favourites. But it would be Gundam that once again pushes this area of the medium. A few years later, in 1985, Zeta Gundam was released, and you can see instantly the improvements in shading and line detail. Also, the mechanical design has improved so much, 
It's crazy to think that this much development has happened in just five or six years. And then again, a year later in 1986, you can see this happening again in Gundam ZZ. I think one of the most notable developments is the consistency of everything. There's no longer a big quality gap between backgrounds and characters or one scene and another. Everything is as detailed as it needs to be and all fits together very nicely. As I was saying earlier, experimentation is usually the catalyst for development. You can see how experimental shows of the 80s mirror the developments of the decade, starting with Yurusei Yatsura in 1981. This is, I think, one of the very first shows that really starts to resemble modern anime. The show's colourful aesthetic and exaggerated visual presence becomes a staple of Japanese animation. Aspects like the character's hair and the bright backgrounds are all extremely important developments. Another big change in the 80s was the introduction of the OVA productions that went straight to video, allowing creators to bring to life projects that didn't quite fit into the TV or movie template. This started with Dalos in 1983. You can see instantly how it differs from almost everything else. It has its own unique, maybe darker atmosphere and imagery. And again with Angel's Egg in 1984, a visual style that really pushed the kind of art house aesthetic into the medium. You can see influences from very specific areas like Eastern European cinema. Influences that definitely didn't have a chance to appear before. These OVAs are taking steps into the foundation of future styles. This was also around the time where Studio Gainax were founded, one of the first modern anime studios. They kind of revolutionised how studios worked and pushed the boundaries of what a smaller team could achieve, subsequently pushing their own style and influence, which you'll see more in later years. These OVAs also played a big part in the development of the cyberpunk style. Before Akira came along, titles like Megazone 23 and Bubblegum Crisis kickstarted the whole cyberpunk subgenre, elements that anime is now renowned for, like futuristic cities and neon imagery. But before that, we have a wave of movies that would really define a whole generation of films to come. This is of course the birth of Studio Ghibli, a coming together of some of the industry's most important individuals. The first project actually coming before the studio was officially founded was Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. And then their first official film as a studio in 1986 with Laputa Castle in the Sky. These productions were huge steps in many areas. Firstly, animation. Aspects like character animation and crowd animation were outstanding. The detail and movement were completely unique to the studio at the time. They managed to create a sense of realism with their ultra-smooth movement, consistently layered throughout their films, matched only by their spectacular background art. I mean, Nausicaa had 17 credited background artists. Production teams of this scale and talent were really rare at this point in the industry. These films were such a leap. And this kick-started both financially and stylistically a huge wave of anime films from the mid to late 80s. These kind of massive production teams would become more common and subsequently some really amazing work was done. Wings of Honomai's in 1987 was one of the more unique additions. The film had, again, incredible background art and character animation, accompanied with very mature themes, and this was happening alongside the growth of Cyberpunk anime. It was a really influential title. Unfortunately, it was kind of dwarfed by Akira the next again year, and now Akira is possibly the single most influential anime film ever, really. It was at the time, and still is, one of the most technically impressive pieces of Japanese animation. It was obsessive in its attention to detail, every scene containing an unbelievable level of dynamic animation. It's very much a turning point for sci-fi as well. Where a lot of the genre's previous editions had been brighter and aimed at a younger audience, Akira marked a change in a more mature sci-fi audience. And that focus on a more mature audience is something that continues into the 90s, along with a number of other developments. The 90s becomes a really interesting time period, I think you have all this amazing development from the 80s, with a little bit more freedom in the form of OVAs and niche markets. The early 90s in particular are an interesting time period. Titles like Macross Plus offered a really unique take on the cyberpunk genre, and on the franchise in general. This title is very much a preview of what's to come in the decade. I love the interesting blend of old and new in Macross Plus. The character, de the character designs are more in the style of the mid-80s, but the general aesthetic is very 90s. Mixtures like this happen quite a lot in the next decade. There were a lot of improvements in technology as well, which I think completely changed the direction films and series were taking. Ghost in the Shell in 1995 is a great place to look into. Instantly you can see Ghost in the Shell is taking less from the mecha era of the 80s and, and more from those later films of the 80s. Calculated body proportions, very neat line work, smooth animation, realism was the focus of the film. The photorealistic backgrounds and the more traditional clothing choices, this is all part of the growth towards a more realistic style. The realistic style of animation and design is definitely a development that continues throughout the decade. 
You can see it in shows like Evangelion and Gundam Wing the same year. I think this more realistic design is a reflection of that older target audience. Evangelion is a great example of where TV anime is at this point. There's some really, really talented animators working in the industry. It's a great point to kind of gauge where everything's at. But this isn't the only style that's developing. Lots of shows are branching out into different styles. Escaflone from 1996 is one of my personal favourites. It has such a unique fantasy aesthetic. Definitely going in a different direction from the kind of realism other shows are pushing for. I feel like this derives more from video games than anything else, but it's fantastic. It mixes fantasy and sci-fi in the same way Miyazaki done with a lot of his early Studio Ghibli films. And the quality of animation for a TV production is just mind-blowing. And again, another fantasy series, Berserk. It didn't quite get the same level of production value as Escaflone, but the designs are just as awesome. I like how experimental and bold choices with lighting and colour are getting. And that kind of sketchy line work that we've seen back in the 80s has a presence here. And towards the end of the 90s, we have a collection of really solid shows. And this is a special period, I think, especially for audiences in the West. Titles like Cowboy Bebop and Trigon were a really nice blend of everything that had happened over the last 20 years in the industry. These were a mix of so many different styles and genres, becoming a kind of turning point at the very end of the 90s. This was a kind of time where everything was changing very drastically. Around the same time, we start seeing a lot more experimental shows popping up too. This is possibly the most influential development going into the 2000s, and I want to start with revolutionary girl Utena. For me, I think Utena's use of colour and exaggerated imagery are both links to the past with similarities to works like Dezaki, and also previews of styles to come. I think it's a really nice reference point for the changing of styles. And also, Serial Experiments Lane in 1998. We really hadn't had many TV productions that were this visually experimental until now. You can see Lane takes the standard aesthetic and tweaks it to make it the deeply psychological experience that it is. The simpler character designs and subtle background art become a real trend for later years too. Similarly with Boogie Pop Phantom in the year 2000, these signify a very important change in how the industry was working, or more specifically how TV anime was working. All the variables that previously mattered in TV anime production went out the window, and this change ended up making some of the most experimental and visually interesting shows of the last decade. The use of lighting in these series, for example, was just amazing, and the muted colour palettes, it all was so unique and we really hadn't seen anything like it before. This period of experimentation is incredibly important going into the 2000s. A lot of the shows that are made over the next 10-15 years come from this period of experimentation. Whole studios are based around the idea of creating experimental and unique looking shows. It's something that has a real market and stylistically it just explodes the amount of evolution. Going into the next decade, I think a lot of things drastically change. For instance, the use of digital animation is a lot more common. And that changes a lot of things in terms of how many people need to work on a project, how a project can be funded, the resources needed to make a project, it's all very different now. One of the shows that I think encapsulates this progression is FLCL or Fully Cooly, a kind of transitionary anime into the new decade. The show has this really bright, exaggerated aesthetic while maintaining a really high level of polish. The animation and shot compositions are amazing, but aspects of the visual style like background art are definitely a step away from that idea of realism. They kind of revert back to a more playful style that we've seen in the 70s even. And it has a level of surrealism to its visuals and its storytelling, this is very much all a theme of the time. Gurren Lagann is a later example of this, an interesting one because it has this playful aesthetic but such a high level of polish. You can see the wild but amazing line work in almost every detail of the animation. And this is kind of due to the developments in digital animation. Digital animation really becomes one of the most important and most influential aspects of the industry. Shows kind of revolve their world around this idea, and it leads to a wave of very, very exploratory but also very high quality anime. But of course, the more realistic style that we saw in the 90s doesn't just disappear. In fact, it continues to really develop and produce some of the decade's most visually impressive works. Ghost in the Shell standalone complex was a great alternative adaptation to the previous decade's film. Ergo Proxy in 2006 
6 was a fantastic development on that dark, muted style from Serial Experiments Lane's era. And going back to the more experimental phases of the 80s and 90s, because they do continue to progress into the 2000s. In fact, in the 2000s there's more experimentation than ever. Studio Shaft is one of my favourite examples of this. They are behind some of the most visually impressive titles of the decade, shows like Sayonara, Zetsubo Sensei and Monogatari. They have all of the characteristics of those previous phases, with an added layer of quality and finesse. Some of the shows Shaft have made over the years are outstanding in their animation quality, their smoothness and, and just their general production value, without them losing that experimental flair. Also, you have this collection of practitioners during this period, creating some of the most experimental shows. People like Misaki Yuasa, Kenji Nakamura and Rei Matsumoto are a few great examples. These practitioners all use animation and resources in a way that has never been done before. Misaki Yuasa, for example, creates these huge worlds with extravagant animation, using very small teams and simpler tools. And all of this progression leads up to the current set of styles. The landscape at the moment is one dominated with digital animation, causing almost every show to have a very unique style. For example, you can take any five anime films from each year and, and chances are they'll all have their own visual identity. But they'll all be firmly rooted somewhere in the past, even the most exciting new designs will have its influences in the works of Dezaki or Tezuka. And that is fascinating. We're in a new internet driven era and the landscape of animation is changing. I think the fact that creators like Misaki Yuasa are given opportunities is testament to how creative the medium has become, and we can only really hope for that to continue. And I hope you've enjoyed this video and the last few videos I've made about visual development in anime. I've spent quite a few months researching and making these videos, so if you enjoyed them please do check out some of my other videos and click subscribe. I have similar videos looking into specific areas of development that you can check out by clicking them on the screen. But for now, thank you very much for watching.